Okay, I titled this video Is Scalping Legit? because I wanted to take just a few minutes and put together a video that sort of explains the methodology of scalping from not my viewpoint, but from the viewpoint of guys who are very well known traders who have traded for millions of dollars and uh, actually agreed to do interviews over the course of their careers. Um, this basically came about as a result of me getting emails that ask about methodology and I, and I get them on a pretty frequent basis. So people who have been in the trading world for a while and but who have never watched the order flow or watched the, the depth of market very closely, they feel very lost when they look at the depth of market or the ladder. And of course, newbie traders, um, or I should say people who are, are very new who haven't done much trading at all, most of those guys start right in with technical analysis because that's most of what they read about in the books and the courses and whatnot. Uh, so they take one look at the depth of market or they, they take one look at the depth of market and the same thing, they have no idea what they're looking at and they basically don't see how you can make heads nor tails of what they're seeing. But the, the reason for that is because they don't understand what they're seeing. Um, the reality of the situation, and I'll bring up a screenshot here. Uh, this is just a screenshot of my treasury ladders and depth of markets, and you've seen them in my other, other videos if you've watched my other videos. Um, the reality is that the depth of market is really the most simplistic of trading uh, indicators, I should say, or you know things that you look at when you're trading, and it's certainly the most pure form of information because the reality is that the markets are nothing more than an auction. It's people offering to buy, people offering to sell, and then when they come together, they match up at a certain price. That's what you see on the depth of market. Everything else is an extrapolation of what you see right here. Everything else you see, all the indicators, all the charts, everything is taking this information right here, which is the core information or the fundamental information, and then trying to reduce it and label it and turn it into either a pattern or um, you name it, whatever it is. You can go forever, as we know. So what you see here is, is on the left-hand side, as usual, uh, I have the 10-year. The in the middle, I had the 30-year. And then on the right, I have the 5 here. And I'm just going to use the treasuries as an example because uh, a lot of these, some of these guys that... Um, I'm going to go through in the interviews, they were treasury traders, so it'll just kind of match up to what they're saying. So, for example, you know, I received an email not too long ago and it says, what I've seen is that traders who don't have a strong trading methodology are often suckered down the path that the issue is their psychology. I personally have found it easy to locate good material about trading psychology, whereas it has been very difficult to find people who can exercise and teach a winning trading methodology at least when it comes to day trading. And I couldn't agree more with that. I, th I think there's tons of material out there that is focused on psychology and risk control and trade management because that stuff is actually the easiest stuff to learn, really. Um, it's very easy to break that stuff down mathematically and scientifically, whereas when you start getting into playing the gigantic poker game known as uh, trading, now you have discretion becoming involved and you're trying to anticipate the future um, and anticipating the future is not always that easy sometimes it is easy sometimes it's impossible you know and, and even people who write programs I mean even even the programs themselves are based on discretion I mean let's be real guys who who write the programs are basing it on some form of a, a discretionary call on their end uh, so what this guy is getting at is basically methodology, right? So you come into the, the game of trading and you start looking around and you're trying to figure out, well, what should I be doing? What should I be doing? What should I be doing? I don't know. So then you come across a site like mine and here I am and I'm saying what you should be doing is scalping. If you're going to be a day trader, you should be a scalper, right? And then you see this, you know, why size matters and you see this little cartoon thing that I had a guy make for me. Um, and you, you have a guy going 3,000 even and a guy going buy one. And, you know, if you're a new trader, you have no idea what that means. That's why none of it makes any sense to you. In the same vein, 
when you read some interviews or articles by traders who have made it very big, uh, a lot of that stuff won't make sense to a newer trader and even and some experienced traders because they don't have a frame of reference for it. There's no context. They haven't seen the business from the inside. They've never um, traded size or seen someone trade big size. And by size, I mean you know hundreds or thousands of contracts. Uh, they've never worked for a firm or a bank that does uh, major trades. And so they're completely lost. So for example, like the Market Wizards books, um, I discussed those you know, in, in some of my uh, pages right here, actually on my foreign experience page. And I'm talking about uh, Jack's interview with Tom Baldwin, who was a big floor trader, and he moved off the floor. And we're going to cover one of his interviews really quickly in this video. You know, that interview doesn't make sense to most people when they first read it. And it didn't even make sense to Jack. And he, this was the guy who was writing the book, you know. But that interview is the best interview in the book, um, in my opinion, anyway, because it just it sums it up really, really well. So what I wanted to do was just to go over a few interviews and articles and see if I can maybe help you understand what the guy is saying so you can put it into context so that when you're trying to decide what kind of a methodology you want to use and when you're trying to develop strategies for day trading, you have a better frame of reference for how these guys actually trade. And I guess that's the real key. So when someone is trying to tell you, you know, well, this works or that works or trend following works or, uh, you know, whatever, you have to you have to ask yourself, well, who who actually has made money with that, you know? And see if you can find articles or interviews with major traders who talk about that stuff. What you're going to find is when you start reading the interviews with, with major traders, you know, some of them talk about technical analysis, but they all basically get down to size moving the market and playing this big poker game um, and talking about how size influences it. And a lot of the guys are, are straight up scalpers. So... What I'm going to try to, to explain here, and I guess cover, um, swap this over. What I, I wanted to remember how to how to phrase this. You know, I'm not saying that scalping is the only way to make money day trading. What I am saying is you have to understand the mindset of your competition if you want to beat the game. And a large number of your competitors are scalpers who trade huge size. And I'm about to prove that right now. Uh, if you'll scroll down... On my website through my for inexperienced traders page you'll see there are three links to interviews with a guy named Paul Rotter who's also known as the flipper um, Rotter is a massive trader who's managed to maintain uh, some secrecy around himself for a long time until finally the word got out who he was and then, of course, everybody wanted to know who he was because he's a guy who uh, has made hundreds of millions of dollars supposedly and um, I think it's worth reading something that's, you know, an interview with a guy who's, who's had that kind of success in the trading realm. So what I want to start with, though, real quick prior to that is right here, if you go to the, the CME group site, or you can go to Eurex as well, whatever markets you trade, if you look at the um, daily volume and the change in open interest, it tells the tell, really, as far as what guys are doing in these markets. So for the 10-year futures, the total volume, you can look at it right here for uh, Thursday of August 22nd, was 1,313,134 contracts. Okay, That's the number of, of contracts that were traded on that day. Your total open interest at the end of that day was 2,377,69. Okay, That's total open interest. It's outstanding. However, this is the, the important number. The change in open interest was 25,624. So... 1.3 million contracts trade, and yet your open interest only changes by 25,000. That's less than 2%. Less than 2% of the contracts traded were taken and held overnight as open trades. The other, you know, uh, 1.2 plus million were in and out, closed out that same day. So obviously the majority of trading that takes place is nothing but pure speculation day in and day out. I think most people know that, but I just wanted to reaffirm it in case you didn't know that. Um, 
that really tells the tale right there. So and it's also a good argument to be made for day trading versus trying to swing trade or um, do long term trading. Uh, I'm going to take one second here. I have a the recorder. You'll see me bring it up periodically just so I can pause and, and uh, regroup and make a note. So I'm going to pause real quick. Okay, so let's start with Paul Rotter, the, the flipper, one of these interviews I have on my website here. I'm not going to cover this any of these interviews in their entirety. Um, I would highly suggest that you go to these interviews. You can find them all online. You can also look up more from each one of these guys and, and read as much as you can about these individuals uh, and other people like them who are heavy traders, who are on the floor, or who are now upstairs doing a heavy electronic trading. It's very enlightening. So this interview they described right here, it was early 2004 when Trader of the Shats began noticing something funny on their screens. Uh, you would see giant orders on one side of the market that would flip and go the other way. The traders uh, say someone was posting massive buy orders, waiting until the market moved towards that price and then selling instead a massive head fake. Hence the term the flipper. That's, that's where this has come up from. Um, what they're basically saying, if I can kind of explain this to you, is, is like so. You have a guy like the flipper and like for example you see these markets are kind of near their highs maybe on a day it's a little bit slow or on a day when it is a little bit slow you'll have a guy like the flipper or maybe a few guys and they sit here and you see you have 4000 here 4700 and 4300 so they place these big orders at the high of the day and same you see it over here in, in the uh, 30 year as well 1300 and 1300 It's an illusion, basically. Uh, not always, but sometimes. So the idea is that a guy like the flipper places these large sell orders up here to give the illusion that the market is going to run into resistance at those areas. There are some big sell orders there that will hold the market down. The idea is that this will keep the market kind of weak and cause people to sell right below it. Um, meanwhile, the flipper is actually buying the market. So he's not getting short and he's not offering to really try and sell at these prices. He's offering those that size out in an attempt to hold the market down long enough so that he can buy maybe between 25 and 26. And then whenever he gets everything he wants, he starts bidding the market up towards towards his own offers. That's the beauty of this. So you can have, and it's not always just one guy, but that's sort of the game. So guys start trying to bid the market up towards their own offer. And then when they get to those offers, they pull the offers. So that 4,700 will disappear to maybe 1,200. And all of a sudden now a market that looked like it had resistance at 27 and 27 half no longer looks like it has resistance there. And so it pops through the highs. As it pops through the highs, the, the flipper who was long down here liquidates at, you know, 28 half, 29, 29 half as the market goes through and uh, actually makes money. So he's playing both sides of the market. Um, that's what flipping is. It still happens on a daily basis. Uh, I'm telling you just for a fact, it does. It still goes on. Um, this is a guy, and I wanted to scroll down and show you this. This is a guy who, here we go, for an individual, Roger scale is stunning. Last year, his personal trading volume alone accounted for about 180,000 contracts a day, or almost 70 billion on peak days. You know, you're talking about an individual who trades 180,000 contracts a day. That's how he trades. He's in and out, in and out, and he's flipping. Now, to follow up on that, if you'll go to this other interview um, at TradingNaked.com, you go down to these questions about uh, what is your tactic. You know, it's a kind of market making where you place buy and sell orders simultaneously, making short-term trading decisions because of certain events in the order book, level 2, slash depth of market slash ladder okay so he's watching the order book uh, for example I have lots of orders in different markets at the same time pretty close to the last traded price the resulting trades are usually a zero-sum game but I get a good feeling for what's going on and then ultimately I can make a decision for a larger trade so what he's saying there is that he will always be kind of working orders in this inside market range on the bids and the offers and then he feels out kind of what's happening 
and those trades can end up being you know a zero sum game whereas he loses two takes makes two takes loses two makes two and then once he gets a feel for what the direction probably is he goes with that trade heavy and tries to go one direction now but he's not going one direction for 15 ticks and this is where I want to point this out how long are you usually in a position since I do trend plays very seldom and actually scalp the market I constantly get fills in different markets on both sides um, sometimes I change my opinion several times within a couple of minutes I'm only looking for the next three to five ticks let me reiterate huge massive trader trading 180,000 contracts a day or more he's only looking for the next three to five ticks this guy is your competition okay keep that in mind moving on Tom Baldwin uh, the guy from the first market wizard book that I, I talked about this is an interview with him uh, posted on turtletrader.com if you do a search for uh, Tom Baldwin uh, and uh, Borish Peter Borish this will pop up on Google. You can find it. So here he's talking about how he manages trades. If the initial trade is wrong and I lose money, I don't, like a CTA, go, well, okay, I'm short 900 and it's five takes against me. I'm going to buy my 900, count up my losses, and start over. What I do from a floor point of view is trade the position. That might be buying 3000 at whatever price I can get out, carry the market with me, and sell it higher. Um... To continue on down here, basically, what's the point of me just getting out of my position? I might as well, if I'm going to buy 900, I might as well buy all I can and in the process move the market and then I'll make money on what I end up being long. And then if I get reinforced by the rest of the world and they continue to buy it, then I continue to buy it. Uh, so what started out as being a losing proposition, short 905 takes against me, turns out to be a big winner. What's he saying? What he's saying is very simple. It's this. Let's say he's short 900 contracts from around, say, 24 half. The market's moved four or five ticks against him, and now he thinks the market is going to break these highs. He's not just going to step up and cover at 26 half and 27 and buy his 900 if he thinks it's going to break the highs. He's going to reverse his trade. So he's going to cover at 26 half, and then he's going to buy another 15, 1800, 2000 at 27 and try and help break these highs and carry it on higher. So now he goes from being short 900 to being long 1800 and the market pops through the highs by three or four ticks. He's turned a losing trade into a winning trade without ever even getting out of the market. He's gone straight from short to being long and in doing that his size because he can trade big size helps to cause that break through the high and then if other people come along with him and behind him they carry it higher and then he makes money once again you'll notice he's talking about it's five takes against me I turn around and then it goes in my favor and it may go in his favor three or four it may go in his favor six or seven but you're talking about a guy who is a scalper a guy who trades thousands of contracts and he's a scalper that's how he trades uh, pausing one moment okay moving on this is a PDF you can download. If you'll go to Google, just Google Harris Brumfield, Pit Trader Gets Wired. This will be the very first link that pops up. Uh, you can download this for free. This is an article with Harris Brumfield, who was a, uh, a pit trader who turned screen trader, and then he started TT, basically, um, which has made him a ridiculous amount of money, but we won't get into that. Uh, nevertheless, Brumfield was a huge, massive pit trader, okay, traded thousands of contracts in the uh, tenure T-note pit, as it discusses right here. So if we scroll down a little bit here, someone, you know, he's asked, did your trading style change over the 10 years you were on the floor? And his answer is, well, I change stuff all the time, but the style itself, being very active, putting on a position trade, and then scalping around them, never has changed. So his basic strategy uh, was he would try to pick a direction, but when picking a direction, he would also be scalping around that position the entire time. Uh, if you'll go down a little bit farther, here's what we see. What was typical size for you? In the 10-year T-note pit, I probably participated in about 20% of the volume, which is just amazing to think about. With the boomed, I would trade as many as 130,000 size, uh, sides in four hours. It's just 
beyond the frame of reference of most people how much size that actually is, okay? And I'm just showing you this because I'm trying to explain another trader who trades huge size, and he's basically a scalper. You know, he's in and out all day long, and he's going for sh short-term moves, and every now and then he hits a home run. But that's not what he's, that's not what he's trying to do, and that's not really the, the fundamental bread and butter of his trading. His trading is pr predominantly scalping. And he discusses something down here, which I think is interesting. Um, he's talking about moving from the pit to the screen, and he says also uh, the funds could be anonymous on the system, which allowed them to sell thirty thousand and then buy twenty thousand instead of just selling ten thousand. They could bluff and get away with it. They can't do that through the phone, phone clerks in the pits because you can pick them off all day long. So what he's saying there is that. If you're trying to get net short 10,000 contracts, you're not just going to go into the market and try and sell 10,000 at market. It's never going to happen. What these guys do, I'll bring up a screenshot, is they work orders on both sides and it nets out to net 10,000. So you might, I often get the, the question, you know, I don't get it. Why? For example, like right here, how do you get 46,000 at 25 and 46,000 at 24 half? You know? Um, how can that much size trade between two prices? What's going on? I mean, is, is somebody really building into such a huge position? What's happening? That's your answer right there, guys. They're, they're working in order to net out a certain amount. So it's, it's intentionally designed to confuse other traders. I mean, that's, I think that's where a lot of new traders sort of, they don't, they don't understand. This is not just an, an all or nothing game where everybody's all in, all out. Um, or people are just firing based on fundamentals. This is a poker game, and it's played between guys who have tons of money, and, and you and I are just small fries, basically. I mean, we can play in the game, and yeah, we affect the market if we all go the same way at the same time. If, if 2,000 traders all uh, you know buy 10 lots at once, we're obviously going to move the market. But in general, it's a game being played between guys that have tons of money, and they're trying to fake each other out all day long. And that's how they do it. So a guy, you know, has an opinion, let's say, going again, if a guy has an opinion the market's actually going to break the highs probably, and he's going to be the one to help carry it there, he's not just going to sweep the highs and buy 8,000 contracts at 27 and 27 half. That's a lot of risk. And he's also moving the market against himself. He's going to linger back here and, and hang back if he can. And he's going to sell some at 25.5. And then if he can hold the market down, that'll push the market back into him. And then he's going to buy some at 24 and 24 half. And then he's going to do it again. And he's going to sell and he's going to buy. And he's going to sell and he's going to buy. Only every time it goes up, he sells a little bit less. And he buys a little bit more. So that over the course of 30 minutes or 40 minutes or maybe less, uh, maybe more, he nets out to being long 10, 12,000 contracts. And then he takes a run at trying to sustain the highs, hoping that he can cause a move to break the highs and then he gets paid on his 10,000 contracts from down here and up here he may even break even. I mean he may try to carry the market up at 27 and 28 and then the market bounces around but he ends up basically you know breaking even on these trades yet he's up 7, 8, 10 ticks on his 10,000 contracts from down here. Uh, that's what the guy is talking about here in this interview. So Again, large trader, a lot of size. That's how he trades. Um, I want to talk about this guy briefly. I'm going to pause one moment. Okay, if you'll go to Google and Google Bill Lipschitz Market Wizards, I believe it's on page two of Google, you'll find this uh, link to books.google.com. And you'll find an excerpt from the actual interview done in the, uh, the new Market Wizards book. Uh, well worth the read. The, the The entire book is actually well worth the read. I didn't think it was as good as the first one, but it was pretty good. Anyway, I just wanted to point out this section of the interview. So Bill Lipschitz was not a scalper. I mean, he actually did uh, bigger plays that were based on some fundamental information and whatnot. But when you read the interview, this is what I'm getting at. Like when you read the interview, if you've been trading and watching the order flow for a while you start to realize what this guy is talking about throughout the interview. And periodically he makes reference to size trading and, and how it moves the market. Um, so it just reinforces what I'm saying. 
he was basically short the dollar, uh, and he got trapped in a very bad move against him. Um, it was it was way 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 against him. And so what he says here in this interview is he says, uh, "All I wanted to do was make it through to Tokyo opening at seven for the liquidity, meaning that Tokyo there would probably be more volume in the market. If you really have to buy three billion, you can do it in Tokyo. You can't do it in the afternoon market in New York." You can't even do it on a normal day, let alone a day when major news is out. My strategy was to try to cap the dollar in New York. Normally, if you sell several hundred million dollars in the afternoon New York market, you can pretty much take the starch out of the market. I sold 300 million and the market went right through it. What's he saying? Okay, Again, going back to uh, our screenshot here, what he's saying is, and this is obviously treasury, it's not a dollar, but what he's saying was he was short in a big way. The market is moving heavy against him. He feels like if he can sell two or three hundred million worth of, of the dollar, he could at least stop the market and maybe cause a little bit of a pullback, uh, which would make his position not look so bad and maybe slow down the market through the overnight until the Tokyo Open. As it turns out, he ends up selling that and the market just blows right through and keeps on going up. So... I'm only pointing this out because, you know, it's a very, I mean, he, he, he just straight up says it. You know, his strategy was to try to cap the dollar in New York. I mean, that's, that's manipulation, guys. That's exactly what manipulation is. There's nothing illegal about it. It's just that's what's happening on a daily basis. And, and what he's saying is, you know, if you want to stop the market, you can usually do it by selling that amount in the, in the afternoon New York market. So you have to imagine how many times this guy was sitting there watching his screen and, you know, it's the afternoon market in New York and he realizes that the market's uh, kind of weak and he understands that, you know what, I can probably go in and, and sell $100 million here, $150 million, and drive the market down a couple of ticks and maybe scalp out a little bit of money before the close. I mean, I'm not saying that was necessarily his main strategy. I'm saying, you know, a guy that can read the market that way he knows that's a valid strategy, and he does that, and other guys do that, and that's what guys do all day long in these markets. So they pick their spots, and they, and they pick spots where they think that the size they swing can actually stop the market, move the market, influence the market, and then they try and make it go uh, the best way they can, and of course they always are hoping that they have reinforcement behind them. So when Lipschitz sold up to sell, sell $300 million, what he was hoping was he was he would step up to sell three hundred million, and then maybe he'd get another three hundred million behind him from other traders around the world who would you know go oh there's some guy stepping up to sell then we'll go ahead and take our our profits on our long trades, and instead everybody just kept on buying uh, or stood to, to the side and let the market continue to rally. So he got caught in a big way. It's an interesting story though. You should read it. Um, one moment. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up with this article here. Um, if you look up this article, it's on Panther Energy, and it's higher frequency trading firm Panther Energy find in a spoofing case. So they were accused of using sophisticated computer algorithms to illegally place and quickly cancel bids on commodity contracts, a practice known as spoofing. What was illegal about it, I don't really know. I'm not sure how they managed to get a, a conviction on this, but they did. And down here they go on to explain what they did. For nearly three months in 2011, Panther would place a small order to sell a futures contract. Uh, it would then place large orders to buy similar futures contracts at higher prices, giving the impression to the market at large that there was a big demand. But the firm would then quickly cancel its buy orders as soon as it sold its contracts that it wanted to sell. What they're saying, this just goes back to what we've been talking about and, or what I've been talking about in this video. Um, you basically have a situation where a guy is <clears throat> trying to sell three or 400 contracts or 500 at, at 26 half. He will inflate the bid at 26 or at 25.5, which you see right there. You see a, a bid of 5,400 there at 25.5. That could easily be a guy who's actually trying to sell six or seven hundred right here at twenty six half, and as soon as he gets filled on his offer, he pulls that bid away. So the market no longer looks as strong as it did 
and then you know maybe it's 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 always a, a maybe to this, but um, maybe the market falls back in and he ends up making money on his his short position. So these guys were spoofing in and out all day long, placing and canceling orders, which is what tons of people do. Uh, so again, I'm not sure exactly why it was illegal or what they caught him on, what they where they messed up, what they did. So what I also found funny here is you know the this. The uh, CFTC, they say, the good news is that regulators around the world are starting to catch up with the cheetah traders like this, and we are shutting them down when they violate the law. You know, it's, it's hysterical because they say they're, they're finally catching up with them, and this is an, uh, a tactic that has been used forever since the inception of markets. It's become, I think, a little bit easier with the electronic markets because no one knows who you are when you place an order. But this, is, this tactic was being used in the pits, you know, for a very long time. You would just have a, a trader who would use five or six different brokers to help him execute his trades. Um, so he might be wanting to sell 2,000 contracts or 3,000 contracts, and then he would have brokers come in that worked for him, and they would be bidding just underneath where he was trying to sell. He would get his contracts off, and then they would lower their arms. Um, same exact thing. So I guess these guys are, are finally trying to – these guys, I mean the CFTC and the regulatory agencies, they're trying to put a – a squash on this type of action. Whether or not they'll succeed, I don't know. But right now, it's still spoof city every day. Um, and you kind of need to know that. This is where I'm going with this. So you have a firm that was doing tons of trades all day long, in and out, all day long. Um, and they were not playing for large moves. This is a guy, you know, this firm was working orders, working orders, getting filled, scalping a couple of ticks, working orders, scalping a couple of ticks. And I think that's another misconception is, you know, computers are basically now the, the, the same as people were. So you have computers who are always trying to jump on board and get the best price and be the first in line. Uh, and they get out too whenever the momentum stops. So they're in and out all day long. That's why you see choppier days. That's why you see more range days. That's why it's hard to get follow through because you have so many programs and algorithms along with normal people playing for shorter term moves. Okay, so where does that leave you and I? Um, basically, it leaves you in the position where if you're going to be a day trader uh, or really a trader of any type, you need to at least begin trying to understand the mindset of this guy right here. You know, you need to understand the mindset of the Paul Rodders, the Tom Baldwins, the Harris Brumfields, and the countless other traders in the world like them who trade large size and who are scalpers making short-term trades. Because if that's those are the guys that influence the market. So if they're making trades that are going to influence the market, you want to be going the same way they're going. You're the, all you can do is ride their coattails essentially. You know, so clearly if the market's at the high. Your, you know, there's 4,700 on the offer. Your two lot or 10 lot or even 50 or 100 lot isn't going to make that offer leave. You know what I mean? You have to be hitting that whenever you think three or 4,000 is going to trade there and then two or 3,000 is going to trade here and they're going to, and the bigger players are going to carry it up. Um, that's when you need to be getting on board. You have to ride along their coattails. So take that in for what it's worth. Read over those uh, articles and interviews. Look up some more articles and interviews along the same lines, and then I'll leave it to you to, to judge whether or not you think scalping is a valid methodology for trading. And, of course, scalping has kind of a wide definition. It, it's, it can be for one tick. It can be for 10 or 15 ticks. It's not necessarily just playing for one or two ticks. It's just most scalpers aren't anticipating a 10 or 15 or 30 tick move. Every now and then, yeah, you get one. You happen to get on board the move. You're right. The market goes one direction, and you get paid really, really well. But you can't base your long-term consistency upon those trades. Those are those are uh, the bonus trades that add a, a you know a nice chunk to your bottom line at the end of the year. But your daily trades and your consistency has to come from understanding how to make better calls based on short-term moves. And uh, if you can only get two or three ticks, and you take the two or three ticks, you know uh, that's just kind of the way. That's the way that I play it. It's the way that scalpers play it in general. It's the way that these guys who who are huge traders play it, and they're even telling you that's how they pl they uh, play it in their interviews. So, 
that's that. You can decide for yourself if scalping legit. And thanks for watching.